Hey TCS TV viewers, it's Dave and Evelyn coming to you live from the camera store and tonight we're talking about a special topic, the new world of content creation and how to stand out from the crowd. We're going to have a special guest on here tonight. We have Dunna from Dunna Did It. And uh, yeah, Dave, what do you think? <laughs> uh, well, and I can't wait. He's a very interesting guy, so it's going to be a in, uh, very good show. Uh, this event is sponsored by Sony Canada tonight. We have our local rep, Anthony from Sony, who's in the chat to answer all your technical questions. So uh, feel free to hit him hard with all the uh, really technical stuff that he has to squirm about trying to answer, which is a lot of fun. I'm always trying to find the most obscure facts that we can do and see what we can uh, make him squirm, which is quite fun. Um, if this is your first time tuning into one of our live events, uh, you can tune into all these live stream events here at our our channel check out at the camera store.com um, and also on our YouTube channel as on <laughs> yeah, you can TV Live. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and then on that note, if you've registered for our event tonight, we'll be sending out an email with some exclusive Sony offers. Um, plus, if you make a Sony purchase, you can reclaim up to 10% back on a prepaid visa on a single item. So if you're in Canada and you register for this event, watch out for that email and you'll get all the details on that. Um, but if you're just joining us now and you want to be added onto that list, you can email me, Evelyn, at thecamerastore.com and I'll make sure that you're added to the Sony list for for all those great promos. Even the A7 V, A7 R5. I don't know, Anthony can tell us <laughs> which cameras are on that promo, but um, otherwise, check your email box. Yeah. Uh, the best part about live streams for us is the ability to interact with everybody in uh, online and in the chat. So um, we encourage your questions. We This is what it's all about. Our guest is, uh, we're having like a chat kind of conversation. It's great to be able to talk back and forth and get the input from you guys. We have a bunch of questions for him already. He's very interesting. So we're going to go from there. But if you uh, don't want to participate in the chat, you can certainly email Evelyn at thecamerastore.com, E-V-E-L-Y-N at thecamerastore.com, and she'll be monitoring that. And we can get to all your questions. Yeah, and of course, this is a live event, which means anything can happen, right, Dave? <laughs> Um, and so we have the TCS TV live dream team working behind the scenes to make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. Wave guys, say hello. <laughs> Look at them in all their wonderful branding. It's wonderful. Um, so that's Drew and Graham, and thanks so much for all of your support as always, guys. Well, this is guys. the first time Graham's been on camera, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, but let's get to the good stuff. Yes, so we're happy to have a wonderful guest tonight, um, and he's hailing from Victoria, BC, Canada, and he's a full-time YouTuber on his channel, Dunna Did It, with a focus on helping his audience improve imaging skills, um, a lot of really great video editing, things like that, and helping you choose the right equipment. He's also an adventurer who will bring you on a hike to a vast ocean or up a beautiful mountain range. His work is absolutely stunning um, and it's in search of everything there is to know about the craft of capturing amazing imagery. So welcome so much, Donna. Thanks for joining us on TCS TV Live. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and of course you just got back, um, and uh, so we got you all busy here, just working <laughs> in the studio and uh, and joining us. So I love your lighting, your setup. You look great. It's all about mood lighting. Thank you very much. Yes, we're, we're kind of matchy matchy. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying trying with some different colors and stuff lately. It's a lot of fun. Love it. Well, let's start off by defining what this means by content creation, and what is it that you do, and where can people actually find you online? Yeah, I mean, content creation is is uh, my understanding of it anyway. This everybody has their own definition or whatever. Is basically uh, a lot of in the imaging world, so photos, videos, anything that we're kind of putting out there online, and it's a, uh, um, I think geared towards people who are creating kind of their own thing, not kind of usually attached to any kind of big company or anything like that. And sometimes it leads into that, but. Um, I think it started with the idea of all this online creation and it's it's cool to talk about it and it's cool to see where it's come because that's kind of where I started was on YouTube as um, as a, a, a creative endeavor outside of my normal work as as it is for so many people and so um, you know like like you said as far as where to find me I'm on YouTube I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter sometimes <laughs> uh, all under Dunna did it but it's it's all kind of the the same idea it's all based around um, my journey as far as learning video photo uh, what gear to use how to how to learn how to do that kind of stuff and make the best content for whatever platform it happens to be whether you're trying to um, 
you know, work for companies, whether you're trying to do commercial work or that kind of stuff, or whether you're trying to get into vlogging stuff for just a YouTube or you're trying to make narrative or whatever it happens to be, just trying to give the tools for, you know, everyone to be able to make what they want to make. And you've been doing this for some time now. What, what motivates you as a, a content creator to differentiate your work? Uh, I mean, how have you accomplished that? I mean, there's so many YouTube channels now. How do you stand out from the crowd? I really think it's going to sound a little cliche, but I think the the person in front of the camera has a lot to do with that. Um, but I am also a very technical person, and I think that that is, is something that kind of works for me in that um, I approach problems instead of trying to think of think of some kind of creative idea that I can then go out and do, I almost kind of create a, a an internal problem for myself where I like, I want to try and do something with this specific technical thing. I want to go shoot in 8K for no reason other than trying it. I want to try and shoot with only natural light or I want to try and shoot with no natural light. You know, I kind of create these like boxes to put myself in and then I technical myself out of them. And that is kind of my creativity. And I think that that, comes through in the in my content in that the audience can see that I love doing that. I love creating these problems and then having to work myself out of them kind of thing. And I really think that, um, you know, showing your joy in your content and showing that you love what you're doing uh, helps you connect with your audience. And if you if you're pouring your personality into your content that way, it's going to be different because you're the you're the only one with your personality, and then you'll find your your audience that likes that personality. Yeah. So in recent years, how do you take sometimes these boring topics? So I mean, a lot of the time it looks like you know you're talking about video editing, you're talking about grading, and how do you make that content into something interesting and something that's going to grab people's attention when we have so many other things that are demanding it right now? Yeah. Um. I mean, it's it's tricky because like and I mean, like you guys mentioned, there's there are so many channels out there. So it's like trying to do something a little bit different than nobody else has seen. But then also just within the scope of that, how do you keep them watching and that kind of stuff? I try and use humor a little bit here and there without it feeling too forced. Um, I'm a, I'm not a dad, but I do have a good pool full of dad jokes when I need them. Um and then, I mean, the other part of it is just trying to create uh, something that keeps moving. I think that's like something that'll keep it from from being boring is like if you watch it back and there's any point where you yourself, as you're editing your content or whatever, are, are losing the attention of even in the editing process, maybe it's time to consider chopping that out. And especially in the in the days of short form content, yes. uh, I feel like the attention spans are, are getting shorter and shorter. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't make long form content. It just means that you got to keep them moving throughout that um, and do interesting things like recently, as as people will notice on my channel, with all my lens reviews, I started doing these little kind of mini, uh, often they're like a hike, but it's like a little mini montage of like some kind of adventure that I'm going on because I thought that was a good way to one, show off the product that I'm trying to review. They can see firsthand without me telling them necessarily what what I think of it right off the bat. Um, they can just see what it's capable of, but also it's just something for them to enjoy and watch for a few minutes that breaks away from, you know, specs and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's something that I tried to do a little bit that uh, I think separates me a little bit from other people, but uh, it's, it, is a, it is a tricky kind of thing to do to find that, that thing that's going to separate your channel. Definitely. You're talking about taking people on adventures and I always love your footage whenever you're going somewhere gorgeous. You love the mountains. Um, so we actually have a clip here queued up um, on Dave's computer from cool. your Sony 24 to 7D. Tried to do uh, a little bit that uh, I think separates me a little. It does just that. It, ta it showcases, you know, you going on adventure. It feels like you're with you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, level, it's, it's a lot of fun. Shots that you have of nature and the details. Yeah, it's cool. And it's a good challenge, too, to try and shoot an entire segment like that with only one lens. A 24 to 70 is a little bit easier than some other ones. I did one with a 70 to 200 that was a little a little harder to do because I have to run 50 feet away from the camera at all times. But uh, 
but yeah, it's uh, it's also a good challenge for me, and that I think again comes through and how fun it is for the audience. Yeah, no, here you can you can stop showing that. So, how important is it for you in terms of color grading? And do you think that creators need to be consistent in their approach so that when people see their video, like they know it's them, they know it's that channel? Um, kind of like you know the old days of Instagram, where when it was more of a, a photo platform. People always seem to have these color palettes that all of their photography would match. Um, are you seeing a trend in that in YouTube? And, and what's your approach to that? I think, I mean, I'm a huge color grading fan. I think if I was to take anything out of the the all-in-one that I do, uh, so like, you know, I, I prep the videos, I shoot them all myself, I edit them myself, that kind of stuff. Um, if I was to take anything out of that whole process and just do that, I think color grading would be it for me because um, I really love it. So I probably go overboard to what's technically necessary for the content that I'm making. Um, but I do like think the that there is some importance. So concerned about. The color grading is that part that people are like, I don't mind recording video, but that editing part, right? Editing, you know, the color yeah. grading is really throwing me off. I don't even know where to start. How yeah, yeah, that? and you, I think... You know, sort of talk people through that and, and work it. I mean, first of all, I, I, I try and calm them down and let them know that it's probably not as important as, you know, as it seems because there are so many videos out there about it and so many people talking about it. And it is a really cool way to separate your videos. If you have really great color grading, it's a really great way to kind of separate your videos from more, I guess, like amateur looking ones. But in the end, if you don't have the other aspects of the video in there, it's still not gonna be necessarily a great video. But once we get past that, the the kind of disclaimer of it, um, I, really, I really encourage people to try and keep it simple. Um, and to use references, I think, is, is kind of a huge thing that a lot of color grading tutorials don't necessarily um, don't necessarily talk about. Sometimes they're like, oh, we're going to try and match this famous movie or whatever, but they don't talk about the fact that like you can do that on your projects. You can borrow pieces and, and stuff from other projects. Let's say there's another YouTube channel that you really like the way that their color grading looks. You can take a screenshot of that, pull it into your software, and then just like fiddle around. Even if you don't necessarily have all the tools or know how to use them quite yet, you can just go in and fiddle around until you think you've got something that's kind of close. Um, obviously, watching YouTube tutorials and stuff is is super handy, but again, I think it's uh, it's it's something that is like a great tool to have, but is less important than it, uh, even myself kind of makes it in my process because it's the one of the parts that I really enjoy. Um, that being said, like if if you can build up those skills, they're uh, they're good to have, and and you can there's work out there for it if that's the way you want to go with it too. What's generally your workflow uh, for for your color grading and importing your footage? Like, what software are you using? I'm in DaVinci Resolve uh, for the whole process now. Um, the last couple of versions of DaVinci Resolve uh, have have gone full blown. It's got like everything in it. They've definitely come a long way from when they were primarily a color grading software. Um, so I made the full switch over uh, and absolutely love it. And yeah, I guess my process um for the for the editing and color grading and that kind of stuff works with the flow of the software so import all my footage i've got a, a hierarchy of folders that are kind of built in and i and i put them into my main i guess folder or main bin in davinci resolve that already kind of organizes everything and then i'm just dragging and dropping all my videos all my audio that kind of stuff um, there are a couple of other programs I use, uh, one called ReCut, that I'll cut my uh, main kind of talking head content. So it goes in and it analyzes the audio and finds all the dead space. And you can, uh, you can cut out all that dead space. So it really saves time, especially when if I'm doing a tutorial or a, or a review and I'm sitting here talking to the camera for 45 minutes straight and I said the wrong thing five times in a row and need to find the right take, it'll go in and chop out and I can just find those spots easier. So I'll go through recut and then cut everything down in DaVinci. I usually go, I'll edit everything, I'll do my audio, uh, I'll color grade, and then, uh, and then you go back and forth a hundred times. I think that's the part that a lot of people don't talk about 
is, uh, you know, it'd be nice if it was, you get through your edit, you get through your audio, you add your titles, and then you do your, your color grade, and then you export and it's done. But really it's like edit, audio, edit, audio, edit, audio, titles, audio, titles, audio, titles, color. You know, you're going back and forth a hundred yeah. times before the, the whole final product is done. Yeah, especially when you have extra cooks in the kitchen and like, can you tweak this? Can you do a little bit of yeah. that? Um, we have yeah, some nodding yeah. over here yeah. going on with, with Drew. Who, can you uh, change the music? Video, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just one yeah. other question on the editing. Um, what did you switch over from initially? Were you a Final Cut guy? Were you Premiere? I was a, I was in Premiere for a long time. And uh, when when we all got locked up at home, Apple did this thing where they extended their three-month free trial to six months. Or no, sorry, it was a 30-day free trial. They extended it to 90 days. And so I tried Final Cut for a little while and uh, just, just to try it. And it was kind of cool. And then I thought, you know what? At the end of my 90 days, since I've got two out of the, the three kind of main big editing software that people are using nowadays down. I'll just move over to the third one. Within the first week of moving over to DaVinci Resolve, I knew I was never going back to the other two. Interesting. Um, it just worked. It just worked really well for me. And uh, and yeah, the the color grading portion of that software is is as powerful as people make it sound. It's really awesome. And with DaVinci, uh, there is like a free version, which includes a fair amount, right? And also the studio version. Do you need or do you get more yeah. out of the studio version for color grading? It's, I mean, it's really not, you're not missing a whole lot out of the uh, the free version. There are a couple of limitations, I think, with 10-bit video files, which, uh, you know, if you're a Sony shooter and, and you're shooting all 10-bit now, um, that might be a thing. But there's like uh, noise reduction, I think you're missing, um, and, and a couple of like plugins. But for the most part, the free version is pretty full featured. Um, lots of people are still just using that. I get, I often get comments on, on my DaVinci Resolve videos, being like, "Is this all available in the free version?" And I'm like, "I, I think so, but like, I don't. I, I paid for it. Like I said, like within the first week, I was like, I'm just gonna go all in because this feels great. So I and, went for the the full version. What are you bringing into it? Are you shooting S log? Are you like, what kind of files are you primarily working with? Yeah, I shoot. Uh, I shoot pretty much everything in S Log three now. That uh, that all the uh, more recent uh, Sony cameras shoot ten bit footage. Um, so I'm I'm color grading pretty much everything. Uh, very few times am I shooting just in like standard profiles because again, the color grading is the part that I really enjoy doing. So I'm not gonna uh you know take that away from myself um <laughs> you're gonna and, give yourself uh, that <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, that's, that's that's me time you know yeah and um, you're finding that and, those uh, files get bigger and uh, 10 bits out there and 8k video are you yeah. finding that the hardware requirements are really starting to uh stack up and eat away at your bank account they <laughs> definitely are question. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> they definitely they definitely do the uh the backup is uh it starts to get really crazy i've just got hard drives and hard drives mm. and you know my my years used to be i used to be able to fit them all on like eight terabytes or something like that in my in the backup drives and now it's like up to 14 terabyte drives that i'm buying so it's uh it's definitely expanded as the files get bigger all right um, so just a reminder to all of our viewers that if you have any burning questions um, or something that pops up that we talked about before, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and again, like Dave mentioned, if you're not logged into YouTube, you can also email them to me, uh, Evelyn at thecamerastore.com. We've thrown a couple um, in from the chat already. Um, but yeah, definitely keep that going. Actually, William Davidson's got a good question because he watched that video clip. I had the same. Oh, thought, yeah. Right. Is that uh, do you shoot all your video alone or do you have a friend along for your B-roll? Because yeah, when you're doing hiking videos or biking videos, Videos and you're doing it by yourself. You're kind of doing the trip twice. The, du the, dun <laughs> the Dunna team. Yeah, the Dunna team. You're looking at it. That's <laughs> that's it. It's just me, and that's and that's part of the. I think that's kind of part of the challenge that I enjoy. I definitely am getting to the point where I think I'm going to have to start uh, start asking for some help. But uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to being all alone. Like you said, I make all my hikes twice uh, because every time I need to set up the camera, walk by it, go you know 50 yards down, and then walk back to pick up the camera. 
um, it just doubles down. So if I'm looking at all trails trying to pick a hike and and I see that it's a two hour hike, I have to basically plan for four hours of, <laughs> of running back and forth. Um, but the nice thing, thing about we'll it, a, we'll take a 20 minute walk and make it an eight hour day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 well, that being absolutely. Said, if you're working we went, by yourself, give us kind of an idea of what your basic kit is, something that you're going out for. Yeah, so I mean, when I head out for for a hike like the one that we saw there, I'm taking my generally my Shimoda backpack. Um, I've generally got two bodies with me. Uh, most recently, it's been the A7 IV and the A1. Um, A7 IV is nice for any time I need to film myself because we got the flip screen on it. They're both great hybrid cameras because while I'm out doing those videos, I'm also shooting photos. Um, and uh, because some of the footage I like to have like a camera in my hand. That's almost the only reason that I'm bringing two bodies most of the time um, is just because I'm supposed to showcase myself as a photographer. <laughs> so we got the a 74 and the A1. And then usually I've got the uh, 16 to 35 G Master as mm -hmm. kind of most of the like walking by shots um, some kind of mid-range zoom. So sometimes that's a 24 to 70. My uh, G Master version 2 is uh, on in the mail on the <laughs> way here. I finally bought it, so I'm excited for that. Um, but also the Tamron uh, 35 to 150 has been a big favorite this uh, this past year because it's, it's big and it's bulky, but it covers so much of a range. So um, if I've got a 24 to 70, sometimes I'll bring a longer lens if I'm somewhere where there might be some some wildlife or something like that. Uh, the uh, the Sigma 100 to 400 has kind of been my go-to lately, but I also just bought the 70 to 200 Mark II, so I'm excited yeah. for that to uh, to get here and change up my whole kit. So um, yeah. I kind of just I'm, I'm a big fan new, of it's constantly evolving. Say again? As things get come out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the thing I think partially about being a gear reviewer too is that <laughs> I'm I'm constantly every time I go out like we saw in the video it's like I have kind of an objective or like a piece of gear that I'm testing too so I end up take carrying way more stuff than I need to but my my kind of basic kit is the is the trifecta you know <laughs> ultra wide zoom mid range zoom long end like so I keep it pretty simple that way I'm a big fan of zoom lenses Awesome. Well, and it's so great. Like Sony E-mount has so many options now, both natively, but then also third party. Um, and yeah. yeah, everything just works together really well in that way. Um, we have a great mm. question here from the chat, and this could open up like a pretty big <laughs> topic. Um, so this Ooh. is from Adventures Alley. Um, what are some of the best ways for newer content creators to get noticed in their marketing? Um, and how do you get seen on YouTube and elsewhere? How do you get seen, Donna? Gotcha. How do you get seen? Um, this is, it might sound counterintuitive, but uh, having quantity on YouTube, I think is really important, especially when you're first starting out. I think sticking to some kind of, of you know, upload schedule, people talk about consistency being really important, but I think part of the consistency is the quantity having kind of a back catalog for people to fall into. Let's say they find one of your random videos that their, whatever their search term happened to hit and you pop up, they click on it. If they don't have more to watch after that, it's more difficult for the algorithm to then suggest you to them, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that kind of goes uh, unsaid a lot of the time is just having, you know, that consistency, having built up uh, a catalog of essentially what become your business cards, you know, the, the random chance that you left a business card on a counter at a coffee shop and someone's going to pick it up is kind of like another video out in the world is like people just randomly or not so randomly, depending on how close they're searching for that specific video, but they just come upon your videos and that's how you get new subscribers, followers, audience, whatever you want to call it. So I think it's really important to, uh, for me anyway, it was really important to stick with my weekly upload schedule for a long time before, before I really got anything done. It's, it's this weird exponential thing um, where once you put out a certain amount of videos and, and it just kind of like catches and then it starts to, to lift off from there.
And then you have to stick with it after that. You can't just stop. But <laughs> now, do you find it's, that uh, your, I think that's an important YouTube part. YouTube videos have evolved as far as the timing or the style or you know sort of the titling. What's sort of working for you? Or do you do much research into what's sort of trending on YouTube and kind of cater towards that? Like, how do you let yeah. your audience grow? Yeah, I mean that's that's a, a huge part of it too. Is that I really really enjoy playing the YouTube game, <laughs> um, where you're you're analyzing those kinds of things. You're analyzing what's working in your videos and what's not. So as you're going through, especially as you're beginning, going through creating that um, that catalog of content. I think understanding where the successes and or successes and failures based on your own metrics, where those are, and how you can kind of go with those. Um, and so I, I, you know, I use a handful of tools to do stuff like that. There's TubeBuddy is really great. Uh, one of my favorites is Morning Fame, um, where you can be researching keyword topics. It'll show you what's popular, what's being searched for, and it'll do it within. Um, within kind of a, a radius of your channel type and your niche uh, as well. So that's something that I really like. Um, I use something called Headline Analyzer, and that is for creating titles. And it gives it like a, it's it's made for blogs and for like news articles, I think. So it wants you to like write out like a hundred character titles, like as long as possible, which some people think isn't a great idea on YouTube, but I use it and it gives it like a score. So I'm always shooting to get like over a 70% like thumbs up on my on my title score for that. And that seemed to work for me. Thumbnails cannot be like, stated enough how important they are that is the thing i think before anyone reads a title they're looking at the thumbnail and they're trying to decide whether that's the kind of video whether that image inspires them to to make that click so i think yeah, that's a, a huge part that is the billboard yeah that's yeah. the thing and it's really interesting hearing them talk about um starting to do uh, the like the little animated gifs of like part of the video mm -hmm. or if you can actually make animated or you can pick like parts uh, that will play a little bit. Maybe it might be the death of the thumbnail. I've heard some some talk about that. But uh, as of right now, I think your thumbnails are probably uh, one of the most important things that you can do. And there are creators out there who will come up with the thumbnail idea before anything else. If they don't, if they can't come up with a good thumbnail idea, they just like don't make the video about that topic, <laughs> which is wild to me. I'm I'm like a last minute thumbnail. I try and make it as good as I can, but it's it's very last thing that I do, which is uh, probably something I should change. But yeah, we can relate. We're yeah. always like, oh crap, we need a thumbnail. <laughs> but you know what? Um, yeah. There's so many great tools out there. Um, I know there's like Video IQ, and same thing. It will score um, your title for uh, for YouTube, but then it'll also score things like your ta your tags and um, and give you ranking. Yeah. And obviously, it's pulling all kinds of information and using AI to determine like what is going to perform well for you, based on your own content yeah, and 100%. also what's out there. So definitely, I think for for totally. newbies, there's a lot more options. And like if you just you know look at tutorials, look at um, Googling, you know, tools for YouTube for your own analysis. There's usually free trials out there too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that's important to say to to anyone who's just starting out in that too is like, look at that stuff. But also, like, the bottom line of it is really just like try and make the best video that you can. If the video is truly good, if the if there's um, you know, if you've gone through and it's actually something that will either entertain people or educate people in a way that's pleasing to them, like that's that's really your bottom line of what you should be trying to do the most out of anything. There are videos out there with terrible titles and terrible thumbnails and no SEO and any of that kind of stuff. But if they're a really great video, they can still succeed. So that should really be the the baseline of everything. Definitely. Um, and I have to apologize to one of our guests before. <laughs> it was um, Adventure S, Ali. <laughs> Thank you for correcting us on that. Um, lots of other great questions here. It looks like we have um, some other ones. Oh, you Robert. To, yeah, you pull uh, that. Yeah. Uh, Robert Diogardi. I hope I said that one right. We uh, should probably not even try. <laughs> <laughs> we should say person said this. Uh, he's really <laughs> uh, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but uh, he's wondering about photo storage. He says, I have thousands of images. What is the best place to do that? Uh, through hard drives, and also like Google Drive, Amazon, external drives. Like, What is your process for backing up redundantly? 
Because I hope you're back. Yeah. So my, I, <laughs> I am now. I wasn't. I wasn't very good at that when I first started out. But uh, so everything comes off of SD cards and goes straight onto what I call my working drive, which is don't drop right it here. Don't drop it. <laughs> this is a, an OWC SSD, um, and that's a, a two terabyte drive. So this is anything that I'm like currently working on. And uh, it also gets backed up to something called Backblaze, which is an online cloud backup uh, service that you can use. Um, and then as soon as I'm done with the project, it gets dumped onto uh, big HDDs uh, that I have uh, two for each year. So basically every year, right around Christmas time when there's sales and stuff, I'll buy <laughs> two big hard drives. Uh, one is the main backup and then one is a duplicate of that other backup. So all the time I'm constantly going to two copies and up into the cloud. Um, the next step is to have off-site backups as well. Um, so making a, a making my duplicate not in the same place as my uh, my main backup, but uh, that's that's a problem for 2023, which I'm a little late on getting started. But it's still early. It's still early. <laughs> it's still early. Yeah, I haven't finished any projects yet this year, and so I haven't needed to back them up yet. It's like a New Year's resolution for a lot of photographers. I think is to like I'm going to get last year organized. Yeah, 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 yeah um, totally. <laughs> so one of the other questions that I had for you was about top performance. So from what I could see, your top performing video was called How to Split Pictures for Instagram. And there's more to the title as well. But what do you think, why do you think that that was the top performing video for you? Um, and what are you seeing now as far as trends go for videos that are just really hitting it and you know going viral, quote unquote? <laughs> I think there there's something to to the simplicity of that video. Like it's a, it's a Photoshop tutorial. In the in the end that's basically what it is. Like I'm showing people how to make those those carousels where you basically get one wide picture and chop it in the middle so that you can slide between it but it looks seamless kind of thing. And there's something about the simplicity of it um, that I think just hit really well, but I also think this this is maybe just in the back of my mind. There are easier ways to do it than the way that I knew how to do it at that time. And I think I even say in the video, like I'm not a Photoshop expert. Like I have a couple of tricks, but like this is how I'm doing this right now. So like, that's great. There was a lot of chat in the comments about how everybody else does it. Somehow there got to be mm. these conversations about, oh, there's this little trick that you can do that makes it a little bit easier. And there's this other one that makes it a little bit easier and, and all that kind of stuff that was happening in the comments. And that I think really helped the video to blow up because it's like people came in and they got, maybe they th got a different way than they were used to doing it, but then they were also sharing their own ways in the comments some positive and some in a negative way where they're like, who's this idiot and why is he doing it the hard way? Or, you know, those kinds of things. But like, uh, you know, engagement is engagement. Um, so that's my kind of theory on why that one specifically blew up. And I actually ran a bit of a, um, uh, an experiment about a year after I uh, posted that one and it had been doing really well, I made another one that was basically the same topic. Um, it, it's uh, currently, I think it's like my 10th most viewed video and it was the same kind of Instagram carousel thing, but this time it was more of a collage. So there were like lots of, uh, lots of photos in it. So same concept. I brought up some of the ideas that I had learned since the first one. And it also did really well. Again, lots of comments, uh, about of how people, other people are doing it. So I don't know if it was the Instagram part, the Photoshop part, or the fact that like it just kind of like seemed to inspire like community around this topic somehow. Um, yeah, those. I mean, that's my best guess as far as why those two did as well as they as they did. But there is definitely uh, something around Instagram based content. I think people want to want to be really successful on Instagram specifically. I think there's some kind of social clout around that <laughs> that uh, people are searching for a lot on YouTube. Um, so I have a, a handful of Instagram-based videos that are doing really well. And then I think anything that can kind of blur that line of like entertainment and education does really well on uh, on YouTube because that's really okay. what people go to YouTube for 
a lot of the time is either like a little bit of entertainment, but a lot of like, I need to learn how to do X, Y, Z, and then they go in and search for it. So if you're a search based channel that way, yeah. I think that you can, you can capitalize on that a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. We always call it edutainment. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, yeah. that's honestly how I personally use YouTube a lot is like how to do mm -hmm. this, how to do that. Um, so anytime you yeah. can have that topic. And then I think, as you said, the combination of being able to have that engagement um, and get people talking, like even if it might not be, you know, the most best way to do something or, um, you know, even just having the best setup or something like that. I think sometimes it's good to yeah. experiment too, right? Totally. Yeah. And I think there's, uh, there's, it's kind of fun to see people in the process. So I think me starting that video by saying like, I'm not, I don't think of myself as like a Photoshop professional or anything like that, but like, here's a cool thing that you can do that like, I kind of know how to do. Um, I think it really brought people in to, uh, to see like, this is a person just like me. I'm learning how to do Photoshop. I'm learning how to grow on Instagram. And so they could, uh, they kind of saw themselves uh, in, in that video. And I think that that was partially what created mostly a really positive uh, experience for people on that video. It does work the other way around too. I've got a, a fairly popular video that most of the comments that I think drove it to be popular were people getting a little upset. And uh, so I think, again, engagement is engagement, <laughs> but. Yes, well, we, yeah. can, we can attest that because um, since we took over our YouTube channel, um, our most viral video was this like silly <laughs> Halloween thing that we did um, where we called it, um, what did we call it? Paranormal activities. Paranormal camera Paranormal activity. activities. And it was just like a fun little like Halloween piece. It was really cheesy, but it did kind of look yeah. like it was actually surveillance footage. And so our entire comment feed is like, that's fake. Totally fake. Definitely fake because you put the <laughs> camera in the fridge and it has over a it's million. 1. 5, it's 1. like 1.5 million. million views. And we actually say, right, happy Halloween. <laughs> like we're not covering up. We're not trying yeah. to pull it off. Yeah. But that, that video, That's it must the, come up in the loop or something of people that are looking for like paranormal activity videos or something. And then our silly little camera <laughs> store video comes up. Yeah. But With that being said, I mean, how do you, I mean, you're an online personality I and mean, you're opening yourself up to the comments, right? And YouTube and internet yeah. isn't always nice. Um, you know, how do you sort of deal with that? How do you sort of, you take it personally? Do you, you think about that when you're going on your long walks and recording yourself walking up things over again? <laughs> right? Are these the thoughts that go through your head? Like, oh man, that, you know, you know, one guy that it, gave one, two, three, he said that I walk funny. No, right? You know, it's like, how do you take your comments? Yeah, you it is. That? It is, it is difficult to not take that stuff personally because you do feel like on, on the creator side, when you get to scroll through your comments, it, it feels like someone is talking to you. But a lot of the time, I think the, the thing that I've tried to realize a lot of the time is that they're kind of just like projecting into the ether. They want to say something or they had a thought that came into their mind and there's something something easy about just like slapping that down on the keyboard and hitting <laughs> hitting reply or hitting comment. Um, so I try, I try my best not to take it personally. And generally I just delete negative comments. Like if you, if you came on and, and had something to say and it wasn't like a, not necessarily positive, but if it was like specifically hurtful or, mm. or negative for no good reason, I just delete them. And I, uh, I don't really look back at that point. It's just, I want my channel to be a place that's positive even if you know if someone's replying to another comment and they're and they're hurtful or they're negative i just delete that comment because i don't want anyone going after somebody else in the comment section everybody should just be here to like have fun learn about photography and videography figure out what gear they want to buy you know those kinds of things and uh so i'm i'm pretty liberal with that delete or hide user from channel <laughs> button that's good yeah all right, well, we, I got one more question. I'm going to be the, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot. You should do a video on storage because I have another question about storage here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Guy Trahan says, he says, I'd like to take the storage question a little bit further. He says, what do you do for storage if you're on a longer project away from a main computer or storage? Interesting. Um, generally, my two terabytes on my SSD seems to be enough for any project I throw at it. I don't, I don't think I've gone over 500 uh, gigabytes on any one project, but I also have a drawer full of SSDs 
um, that I sometimes will bring a couple of extras just in case the, my current working drive is is already pretty close to full. So I guess my my solution to that is just bring more SSDs um, on the on the shoot kind of thing. Um, but I know that a lot of people will bring their backup solutions as well. So like uh, right now, like I've got like a, an enclosure that has four hard drives in it and that's my kind of main backup but you can also get portable hard drives so you would be going out with a bunch of eight terabyte portable hard drives to make sure that you're backing up stuff um regularly and i think a, a couple of years ago when i went on like a longer vacation i did that i actually brought some backup solutions to make sure that um because i'm just paranoid about losing <laughs> anything not that it's a Fingers crossed, knock on wood, it's never happened to me where I've lost anything uh, in a in a super hurtful way, <laughs> I guess would be the best way to say it. Um, but uh, but, you know, just in case it's good to it's good to just make sure that you can take that on the road if you have to. Um, and hopefully if you're going on a big project like that, you've had time to plan for that um, but really, there's there's unfortunately no magic genie for that. I think you just have to have the have the tools with you when you go on that. So mm -hmm. more SSDs. About, they're they're it's, finally it's, getting cheaper, which is good. I sort of tell people sort of what, what your comfort level is. Some people are completely comfortable with you know just keeping it on their memory cards for the duration of the trip. Uh, some people run dual memory cards or redundancy that way, and they're okay with that. But other people yeah. bring their laptop, bring multiple drives every time they're back to the hotel or what, wherever they are. But it's what your comfort level is. Yeah, you've had a yeah absolutely. Failure. I used to be, <laughs> yeah, when I was shooting APS-C, none of those cameras have dual slots in them. And I was totally fine with that. As soon as I went up to full frame and I got dual slots, now I'm. it's all redundancy and I'm paranoid of not having the second... Uh, the second card in there anymore it's it's funny how it changes too as you as you get more stuff going on with the backups and stuff I, now i feel like i can't live without it uh, so we have a question from jordan drake jordan in drake. the chat hey, um what's hey, your progression <laughs> of your a cameras over the life of your channel wait sorry will you repeat that again <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, question from Jordan. Uh, what was the progression of your A cameras over the life of your channel? Oh, that's cool. That's a neat. So okay, my first one. This is this is my first camera that I ever bought in December two thousand sixteen. I think it was was a Sony A fifty one hundred, and I mm. was convinced that I was gonna vlog with it and stuff. I took it to Mexico and shot my vacation on it. And then when I came back, I didn't know how sensors worked and I got like dust and sand in the sensor. <laughs> and I thought that that was a problem with the camera. So I took it back to Best Buy, I think it was at the time. And they they returned it because they didn't they don't know anything about cameras in that section, I guess, too. So they were like, this is fine. Like, looks like there's something wrong with the camera. We don't have another one of these. So here's an A6000. It was the same price at the time. And so then I went with the A6000 for quite a while. Um, then it was the A6500. And then it was the A6600. And then where did I go from there? A7 III, uh, A7S III, FX III. And now I have now I have a handful of bodies that I, I go between. So I've got the A1, FX III, A7 IV are kind of my main three. But the one I'm shooting on right now is my, my FX III, which is kind of my main in-studio uh, a roll shot. Nice. Interesting. And if you're traveling and you could only bring like <laughs> one camera and one lens, what would be like your desert island combo? My uh, Alpha One and the oh, only one lens. That's tricky. Dang it. <laughs> I want to say the the 35 to 150 from Tamron. Because that gives me the most range, and if I'm on a desert island, I guess I'll just live without my wide end. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't have any long. You have the one to four hundred from Sigma, but do you find yourself shooting wildlife and wishing you had like a two to six hundred or even something, you know, potentially even longer teleconverters? You know what the uh, the Sigma fifty to uh, sorry sixty to six hundred came out today, and yeah. I've had that for a little while. So now it's making me kind of wish I had a six hundred, um, <laughs> especially moving out to the coast here. When I was in Alberta, where where you guys are, it was 
uh, everybody's a landscape photographer. So it's all 16 to 35s out there. But when I moved out to the coast, everybody's a wildlife photographer out here. So it definitely has made me think about uh, uh, longer lenses to get some shots of the eagles and the, the bears and whales and all that kind of stuff out here. Uh, the 400 has been doing all right for me so far, but uh, but I do, uh, especially having had this lens for a little while now and been playing with having that extra reach, it's definitely been making me think. The The problem I have with it is they're just so huge. You can't, uh, if I'm going on a big long hike, I, I don't know if I'm wanting to carry a 600 millimeter lens with me. Just having a little neck strap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it needs its own bag that's yeah. the thing like it's got its own uh its own thing so i gotta i gotta either figure out if i need bigger backpacks or or what the deal is there <laughs> sounds good now chris in your own progression uh with your a cameras that you were talking about uh sounds like you pretty much start off with APS-C and then now you're mostly shooting full frame um how important is it yeah. to you do you think for a content creator to have full frame um at their at their access or what do you think like in terms of content creators being able to step up their game i think that i mean i dealt with this a lot when i was in the in the audio world too i think that knowing what to do with the equipment is much more important than the equipment specifically especially nowadays um the cameras are just so good like Everything that's being put out right now, and in my opinion, especially from Sony, I'm a big, big Sony fan, um, is just everything is so good. Like if you knew what you were doing with uh, ZV-E10 or the Alpha 1, like you're going to be able to make something really great um, either way. So I think that it's it's more important to know what you're doing with the gear. Um, and I think that APS-C, like what people don't realize, especially in the video world, is that like... APS-C or like that super 35 size sensor is like what they had been shooting movies on for however many years before before we all got full frame in the size of our hands kind of thing so I think that uh not I don't want to say that full frame is overhyped because obviously as you just heard like I have all full frame I love my full frame look I love the ability to get extra wide with the uh, with the 16 to 35 on full frame but I don't think it's necessarily the the end all be all and especially for content creation where you kind of want it to have a bit of a uh sometimes want it to have a bit of a raw look to it and and like it was made by yourself kind of thing um i think that just whatever works in your in your kit in whatever you can carry whatever you can afford i think learning how to use it is a much more important uh skill i mean you mentioned that i mean cameras nowadays are so good Right, the, the image quality is fantastic, but we also need to learn yeah. audio when it comes to doing content creation. Mm -hmm. Unless you're doing voiceovers yeah. in the uh, the studio or what have you, how has the progression of audio mm -hmm. uh, worked with you for both in studio and sort of going on the road? Yeah, I mean, so before before I was into into video and photography, before I started on YouTube, I was an audio engineer mm. for 15 years. I had a recording studio in Edmonton, so like audio was was super important for me. And I think part of the reason that I was able to pick up video fairly quickly is because there's a lot of crossover in the editing and that kind of stuff. Um, and audio has has come a long way. You know, the A6000 that I mentioned before doesn't have uh, an audio input. So I ended up using the uh, Sony makes a, a hot shoe microphone that at the time that worked with it, but it was all auto level. So anytime you're quiet, it cranks the level way up and, and you get the hissing sound and that kind of stuff. So being able to progress uh, through better audio and more affordable, better audio is starting to become, I think, really uh, a lot more accessible. Something like the... Uh, um, the Rode Video Mic Go 2, which I think is under $100. Um, that might be US, I can't remember exactly, but that's like my favorite mic right now. There's no no battery in it, it sounds great, you plug it in and it's and it's good to go. Or the, um, the Sony mics that have no cable in them that just go straight in the hot shoe. They sound great, they've got lots of options in them, and they just like, they work really well without necessarily having to uh, be an audio engineer and be able to finagle your way to a great sound afterwards kind of thing. So I think that the in the same way that uh, great image quality is becoming more accessible, I do think that great audio quality is as well. 
Um, I'm I'm super overkill with pretty much everything I do as far as audio goes. Uh, you know, I've I've got a plug-in chain this long on all my audio tracks because I know how to use that from. Um, you know, all my experience as an audio engineer and like the the microphone that I'm using right now is the uh, the MKH416, which is like a industry standard, like thousand plus dollar <laughs> shotgun microphone and is like not I could do this with a hundred dollar microphone if I wanted to. But I, you know, I'm extra. So I like to go, <laughs> go the extra mile and. I, I hope that it makes that that little bit of a difference that, uh, you know, that I get those comments and, and I do get the comments where it's just like your audio is so crispy all the time, like it's easy to hear what you're saying. So I hope that that makes a difference for someone, um, especially people who maybe don't, you know, English isn't their first language or something like that. Having better audio makes it a lot easier for them. And I mean, you'll hear it on on 100 different videos that audio is as important, if not more important than the video quality. Um, because if people can't understand what you're saying in the video, they're going to click away no matter how well they can see you. And what is your thoughts on even just how you talk to your audience, you know, how you decide to communicate with them, and then what kind of other sounds do you use? Do you use ambient sounds? Do you use music? Like, what are some of the ways that you use other types of audio to, to communicate your message? Yeah, I mean, uh, part of that goes back to, I mean, you kind of, you brought up delivery there, like how you communicate to your audience kind of thing. And I think before there was a um, a kind of question that about the progression of how you make, the, how I make my videos and how that's changed. And the, I think the communication is probably the biggest thing that's changed throughout um, throughout my, my career on YouTube, if you want to call it that. Um, and just like knowing how to sound like myself you know, I even talked about this earlier. I'm like, be yourself. Like, that's the best way to stand out. And it's like, but there is like a, a progression to getting to that point and knowing your own voice and, and being comfortable with it, too. So I think there's a lot of practice that goes into that delivery. And uh, as far as like audio specifically and, and, and the other things that I use, I'm a big fan of having background music uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because like when I'm, you know, sitting watching a video that has some background music, I'm grooving with it. I'm a musician, audio engineer. Engineer, so I like to I like to you know have that groove going on in the background and two if you do have any little imperfections or noise or something a little bit of a noise floor on your microphone uh, I find that kind of covers it up a little bit um, and I use a bunch of different uh, music services there are lots of really great ones out there music bed is, is one that I've used for a long time that has like really really great quality music one that I've been using recently is called track club um, they allow you to uh, access the stems. So that means like all the different parts of uh, of the music. So I can mute the vocals. And then like if there's a guitar solo in the middle of the song or something that would get up on top of my voice and you wouldn't be able to hear me as well, I can mute that out That's and so basically cool. get a custom copy of the uh, of that piece of music. So I've been using that one a little bit lately um, and hopefully we'll be uh, we'll be working a lot more with them this year and uh, yeah, so it's uh, I'm a music guy. Uh, I know some people are are against that, and and you got to be really careful about the level of the music because again, the most important thing is that people can understand you. And I've made the mistake a couple of times where I'm ripping through my edit a little too quickly, and I leave the music a little too hot, uh, and and I get the comments where it's like it's a little hard to understand what you're saying just just because the music's a little too high. So. Uh, be careful of that. So when it comes to putting together a video, you kind of have like a, an overall sense of what you want the video to look like. Do you find yourself using the music to set the mood and or using the color grading to set the mood for the video or kind of what goes first? Yeah. How does your vision that's, come together? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's an interesting one. I feel like uh, I feel like I'm a music guy first. And maybe that goes back to the the music production recording engineer. Uh, mindset, but I feel like the music sets the mood first. Um, I often will pick my music before I start editing, especially if it's like one of those one of those kind of uh, montage sequences of of the hiking or or any kind of commercial thing that do isn't going to have necessarily a lot of dialogue on it. I'll be picking the music first, and then I'm cutting to the music, um, and then the the color grade I think kind of is a support to that. So. Fair enough. Yeah, I think you're you're making me question myself, but I think that's <laughs> not how it goes. 
<laughs> well, and maybe this ties into this, but what would you say inspires you to create more content? Like what is keeping your fire alive? What's driving you? I think for me, a lot of it is uh, the, the YouTube game is is really important to me i like to i'm i'm chasing the the growth and the and the community and and seeing my my videos gradually get more views and that kind of stuff i think is is something that i really enjoy and i know that that's not the case for everybody like some people really like to make art and then they hope that it gets out to the audience i really like the audience and the community part of it and so then i'm you know kind of doing things that i think will will uh blend well with that um, and then, you know, the, the technical side of it, like I mentioned before, I'm, I'm a really technical person, so I'm constantly learning new techniques or new things that I want to try and I'm incorporating those into my videos. I think that really keeps me going. I always, uh, I always talk about myself as, as a creative, when, when people think of like creative people, they think like, oh, you know, you sleep at night and you wake up in the middle of it and you've got this great idea and you need to run and write it down kind of thing. And I'm the complete opposite of that where like, I need to have something technical in front of me that then makes me be creative as like a problem solver. So I think that that side of things and, you know, working with new gear and, and being a gear reviewer is perfect for that because I'm constantly faced with how am I going to shoot something with X, Y, Z piece of gear um, and make it entertaining, make it uh, educational so people can actually see how the gear performs, make sure I'm getting all my testing in. So I think that all, all of that combined kind of keeps me inspired to make, uh, make something, but, uh, I, I have to be doing something different all the time and constantly changing, which I think works pretty well for, uh, the growth on YouTube as well. Definitely. And, and, and that being said, I mean, do you ever find yourself, you know, you, you want to do regular content, you ever find yourself kind of in a rut? Can you find yourself where you're not inspired? You're going through these sort of sort of downward sections and you're like, man, I got to put some stuff out. How do I get myself out of that? What's your sort of uh, techniques or tricks? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's something that everyone who who is trying to do this definitely feels at some point. And even if you're even if you're in a good flow, sometimes it can just kind of hit you where you're like, suddenly you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, <laughs> and I, I was just chatting with a, a buddy about this the other day is that luckily my channel kind of has multiple facets. So it's like, um, you know, the gear reviews, uh, I've got tutorials on DaVinci Resolve, specifically like color grading or editing. And then I've got photo uh, tutorials or photo editing tutorials. So a lot of the time for me, if I'm getting kind of burnt out on, you know, if Techtober comes by and everybody releases everything all at the same time and I'm done with gear reviews, then like maybe it's time for uh, a handful of uh, tutorials or something like that. Just kind of switching it up a little bit and having having a couple of different outlets for the creativity is really nice for me. Um, but honestly, like taking a break is also a great idea. If you're feeling like you're burnt out, like not necessarily forcing yourself through it, um, I think is, is a really great way to just kind of recharge. Um, being around other creators is really helpful as well. Uh, I just spent a couple of days with some really great creators and just got really inspired. Uh, if, if anyone's following me on Instagram, you'll notice that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I started posting a bunch of reels all the time. And my TikTok now has six new videos on it. And, and that was just because I was hanging out with other creators and I was like really inspired by watching them in a flow. And all of a sudden I was like, I should be doing that. That's, that's where yeah. I should be too. So I think that's also one of the nice things about social media and YouTube is that you're constantly watching all these other people do great things. And if you can take that as inspiration instead of uh, what a lot of us do, which is like feeling bad about yourself, not not being out there, if you can try and turn that into inspiration, it's it's invaluable. Definitely. And so we have two questions here in the chat um, and I'm going to try to combine them a little bit. Um, so do you watch okay. other channels? And the other question is, were there any channels that initially inspired you to start your own YouTube channel and get going? Gotcha. Um, I do not as much as I used to. I think I used to watch a lot more YouTube. Um, now, when I do watch YouTube, it's a lot of like travel YouTube. Um, Kara and Nate is one of my current favorites. They've been around for a while and are, are a fairly big channel. And uh, 
Um, my partner and I watch on the on the big TV and stuff like that, and we've got a couple of channels that we go through, but less camera stuff now. Um, and maybe that's just because um, I feel like those are like now my peers instead of the people that I'm learning from as much as uh, as it used to be. But when I first started, I was like, I watched everything. Anyone who had a camera channel, I probably watched their stuff, you know, four or five years ago. Um, and starting out, it was uh, a lot of, I wanted to vlog at first. So it was a lot of Casey Neistat. There was some Peter McKinnon when he was vlogging a bunch at the start. Um, yeah, there was, uh, I'm trying to think of other camera channels too. I know that uh, DSLR video shooter, shooter Caleb um, was oh, great yeah. for like your reviews and that oh, kind of okay, stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it all started with a, a shaving channel. Uh, for whatever reason, I watched this this <laughs> guy who reviewed like razors <laughs> and and I was like, this guy's just he just shaves and he talks about whatever he's using. And I was like learning how to use a, 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 a safety razor at the time. And he's just talking. And I was like, I could do that. I could do YouTube. This is just someone hanging out in front of a camera. So yeah. that was the that was the big inspiration to for start the, with. For the start. <laughs> so the last question that I want to leave on tonight is what would you tell yourself when you were starting out your channel and, and creating content? Like, what do you wish that you would have known back then? What could you tell yourself um, to, to maybe fix some of the things uh, earlier on? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's a tricky one. I Every once in a while, I go back and I watch my first couple of videos. Mm. And I think I started off on a, on a pretty good foot. The videos are not good. They're, they're not great. But like in terms of I quality, like, uh, uh, you think, or yeah, like well, and I'm a rambler. I mean, if if we haven't, you know, we've probably only got through ten questions here, and I I like to go on and on. So I think in those first videos, maybe that would be the thing that I would say is like, put your pull your thoughts together, say them, and then like be done with it, kind of thing. Whereas like I thought that what vlogging was at the time was just just letting your thoughts flow and uh unfortunately i can do that for for a long time if i if i let myself go so maybe that would be it is try not to ramble so much <laughs> <laughs> so you've been shooting sony for many generations of, of sony cameras and you're running mm -hmm. some really high end gear right now the a1 is is pretty phenomenal is there yeah. something you'd like to see in the next generation of sony or is there something mm. that you feel that they're they're missing now that you wish they'd improve on <laughs> I mean, there's there's always stuff that like you're you're excited to see. I'm really excited about what we saw in the A7R5. Uh, actually, I've got a video coming out soon that's kind of my my excitement features from the A7R5. The new flip screen that they've got, I'm excited to see that to come to some more cameras um, down the road because like the the R series is not necessarily for everyone. So I'm excited to see all those features kind of seep into into other stuff, the new AI processor, or the, the autofocus uh, um, processor. Uh, I'm excited to see that trickle into some other cameras. As far as stuff that they haven't thought of that uh, I'd like to see, um, geez. I wanna see S and Q get longer intervals than just one second. How about that? I'd like to be able to shoot time lapses at three second intervals. <laughs> there you go. Without having to shoot photo time lapses, I guess, to be very specific. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Donna. Um, we hope you enjoyed this experience. We certainly did. It's always great hearing your thoughts. And um, I was trying to think back the last time we had you on, um, we were doing that live stream from a mountain on Sulphur Mountain in yeah. Bath. Yeah. Um, but this, this is a lot of fun, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one was, uh, it was definitely a, a fun kind of little trip that we did there. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, a big thanks to Sony Canada yes. for bringing us together, um, being able to make this happen. And if you guys were late on joining, um, if you registered for this event, we'll be sending a special offer uh, to your email tomorrow morning. And um, so be sure to watch out for that. And if you're not on the list or you're not sure, uh, you can email me, Evelyn, at thecamerastore.com, and I'll be sure to add you to that Sony Canada list. Yeah, and we have plenty of live streams coming up and all kinds of events. So you can always check out all the details at thecamerastore.com and also on our YouTube channel as well, the Camera Store TV. Yeah, be sure to subscribe and hit the <laughs> notification button. And of course, we want to know your comments. So let us know your feedback afterwards. Um, you can leave comments below this video. 
Yeah, no, thanks for joining us. It's been great. It's good to see some nice mood lighting. I think we all uh, are on the same page today. Yeah, and of course, big special <laughs> yeah. thanks. You guys can wave again to our TCS TV <laughs> live dream team, Graham and Drew. You guys are awesome. And of course, we hope to catch all of you again soon here on TCS TV.